So I'll just quickly introduce myself. myself my name's Harry. I am the technical sales representative at Neogen in the genomics department. So I'm just going to give a quick um, presentation on TSU sampling and the process that it goes through um, at Neogen and through our labs as well. Um, so there's heaps of different reasons why we prefer TSUs as our preferred sample. Um, the main benefits are that it's fast, so you can quickly load the applicator um, and collect the sample. So the sample here in the is already here in the tube, and you can see the bit of tissue there. So it's pretty much just taking, um, like taking a ear tag, it's just one clip of the ear, and that tissue goes straight into the tube, and the tube already records the barcode. So on the side of the tube there, there's actually um, a sample identification with the barcode at the bottom. And we can easily scan that stamp, um, barcode to identify uh, each individual sample. And so the tissue is also easy to take. So it, like I said, it's just like taking, um, putting an ear tag into the animal. It's just one clip um, ear notch and it's sealed and preserved within that tube as well. Uh, it's clean. So unlike blood and hair samples, the TSU has little chance of cross-contamination. The vial protects the sample from weather and um, any other external particles that can affect the sample. And that buffer or liquid that the tissue actually sits in helps preserve the tissue and stops it from um, breaking down. So the sample, taking tissue is also flexible. You can take a DNA while handling young calves or during animal health protocols. So just during your routine husbandry um, practices. So when you bring cattle in for branding or weaning, you can just easily take that sample as well. Uh, the tissues are also efficient. The sample, sample can be collected from the day of birth. So how to take a TSU sample. TSU samples can be taken during routine or production procedures, branding or weaning. Um, so when you get your cattle into the yard, identify what mob of animals you want to DNA test, whether that be um, heifer calves, cows, bulls, young bulls. And when processing animals through the yard, a simple ear notch is taken by the TSU applicator and TSU, uh, in, into the TSU tube and record the animal ID and the TSU barcode. So here's just a quick step-by-step -step picture of a um, farmer bringing his cattle into the yard, loading his applicator um, as is, bringing the cattle up in through the chute and collecting that uh, TSU sample just up in the ear there. And then once he's taken the TSU sample um, you just remove the tube, record the animal ID and the, um, the TSU number that it was um, taken in. So here's just a video.
So that's just a good quick little video that briefly explains how easily uh, tissue samples can be taken. So when confirming that a good sample has been taken, there's a couple of things to look for. So make sure firstly that a uh, sample is actually in the tube so that there's a bit of tissue within the tube. Um, sample, make sure the sample isn't trapped in the caps um, or doesn't enter the tube. So you can sometimes, if you don't press the applicator down enough, the tissue actually gets stuck up within the cap of the, the tissue um, tube and doesn't actually sit within that buffer and within the liquid. And that can cause the tissue to dry out and become not as good of as enough sample um, to process through our lab. Um, and sometimes if you don't also push the applicator sh straight down, uh, the tissue actually can come back up out of the, the tube. Um, make sure there's enough buffer in the tube. Um, no buffer in the tube leads to degradation of the sample or the sample drying out. Um, again, if you don't click the applicator all the way down, uh, the TSU uh, tube doesn't seal and the buffer can actually leak out. Um, make sure the red cap needs to, the red cap needs to be pushed down. So that within the top of the tube, you can see there's a little red um, cap. And if that's not pushed all the way in, that just also confirms that you haven't pushed that applicator far enough down to seal the tissue within the tube. Um, incorrect selection can also cause sample fail within the lab. And so there's a few different factors um, that influence um, the quality of a sample. So the first one we look at is biological contamination. So cross contamination between animals and species. Um, and mouldy, wet or dirty samples will cause genotyping fails as well. Second one is chemical contamination. So any dyes or drenches that you may put on your animals um, or cleaning reagents, if that's within the, on, on the tissue, it can interfere with the, um, with the lab and the process within the lab. Improper storage as well, uh, impacts the quality of the sample. So any exposure to heat, um, leaving it in the vehicle or indirect sunlight can deteriorate the quality of the sample. Exposure to foreign materials such as mold, uh, improper, fro um, improper frozen storage or the freeze cycle. So that if you freeze your TSU sample, constant uh, thawing and defrosting of the sample can also degrade the quality of the DNA of the sample. Uh, extended sample storage can also lead to um, degrading the quality of the DNA over time as well. So how to post your samples in Tunisian? Correct packaging postage of samples is necessary to ensure they are not damaged in transit. The safest postal method to place some um, form of insulation between your samples and the postage satchel. So some people use bubble wrap to do that. Um, this just provides a barrier and protects your samples while in transit. Um, best practice is to send your TSUs in these blue racks. Also ensure a hard copy of your submission form is sent in with your samples. Otherwise, uh, we put your samples on hold until we have a hard copy of that um, submission form as well. Uh, you can see as well from these pictures here that um, they are a quite hardy sample. It takes a fair bit to um, crack or break a TSU sample as well during transit. I'm pretty sure we've had one lot of TSUs actually got um, squashed by a forklift and they were still fine and we were still able to process them through the lab as well. Um, so once your sample is collected and sent in to us, this is the, the cycle um, that your sample will go through within Neogen. So the sample is collected, sent in to us, and it goes um, through sample entry. So here our office um, staff will actually 
all that data that you've entered, your animal IDs, the sample barcode, they all enter into our system and into our database. And then the, the, if everything matches, we send it up into our lab and it goes through DNA extraction and PCR. So here the DNA is extracted from that sample um, and then PCR, so that DNA is amplified to go through testing. Um, once it goes through DNA processing, it's sent onto um, our data group and our data group also sends um, that data over to our US team for quality um, control and assurance to make sure that all our sample data and the um, results match up. So once data services and reporting um, gets all your results put together, lines it up with your sample IDs and your order, we send it off to um, breed societies and um, places like Genetic Hub and they process that and then put it through um, the, in, um, the genetic evaluation systems, for example, like breed plan to get uh, your breeding values and genomic data, and then that's sent off to you. So TSUs versus hair samples. So hair samples, uh, there's a lot of more room for error compared to TSUs. Uh, we get some hair samples that are sent in and the follicles are actually cut off the hair samples. So the follicles on hair is actually the main important part of the hair that we want. So on top of those follicles, um, that's where we extract the DNA from. So the DNA is not actually contained within the shaft of the hair. Too few follicles is also an issue. So we need um, at least 20 to 30 hair follicles to actually run um, a genomic test. Anything below that, is kind of inefficient for us to grab a good quality result to run through the lab. Um, due to the increased complexity of SNPs genotyping, more hair follicles are required per test. So once we run out of a hair sample um, for for the lab, if there's not enough hair to go back to, producers are required to send in a um, another sample so we can extract the DNA. Small follicles taken from young calves. So calves younger than six months of age or flex tags the preferred sample type just because the hair follicles on the calves are really tiny um, and very difficult to process as well. Limited amount of sample um, for processing. So like I said, if we've already used all the hair sample up to process in the lab and we need more um, sample to go back to, to retest for you, um, yet we require the producer to send in another sample. So we've got more of a sample to work with. Um, there's also a hair surcharge involved when sending um, in a hair sample. So in the long run, TSU actually works out to be a lot of the cheaper and cost-effective method of taking a DNA sample. So TSU has a reduced risk of contamination. It's a lot quicker and easier to process in the lab. The barcodes are already on the vials, um, easy for us to scan and enter into our data management system and results in a fewer mistakes um, and assignments of samples to animals. Less handling and sample exposure. Sample can be taken at any age of the animal, including at birth, and a high sample quality can be used on various tests. So if you're going for um, your 100K plus a genetic defect test that's run on two separate panels, we can actually um, use that sample twice and then we could use it again to, for a BVDV test. So we can use it across multiple different testing throughout our lab. Um, some questions that were asked, so top tips for taking a TSU sample. Best tips for collecting TSU samples is one, ensure your sample has correctly entered the tube and is covered with that buffer. 
make sure there is no cracks or leaks in the tube and correct TSU sample barcode is assigned to the correct animal ID. Best way to collect samples. So the best way to collect a TSU sample is to take a single sample from the ear with one, mo one motion hand action while the animal is in the shoot. Does poron drenches affect the sample? Yes, poron drench um, can affect the sample and can interfere with the DNA extraction process, increasing the risk of the sample to fail. How long can you store them after you take a sample and is it safe to store them in the fridge? Nijin recommends no longer than 12 month storage of TSU. Uh, also keep the sample at room temperature or lower is good practice to prolong sample quality and reduce um, DNA degrading. Is there any questions from anyone? <clears throat> So everyone is muted at the moment. So oh, if mm -hmm. you do have any questions, if you could just put them into the chat box, that will be the easiest way so we don't have people talking over people and stuff like that. Um, so Amanda's question is, are you still getting quite a few failed samples? I don't see the um, how many samples are failing, Amanda. That's more from a, the data team see that. Um, but from what I hear from my end, we, we don't get uh, a large amount of samples failing. Harry, I've had a couple of questions sent through to me, so I'll just read them out to you if that's okay. Yeah, that's no problem. Uh, so Zoe's asked, how do we get the blue TSU racks? Yeah, so you can um, ring up customer service or anyone within the sales team and uh, get a order rack from us and we'll send them out directly from, from us. Right, yeah. Um... Jasmine has asked if you could go through, uh, if you could go into what the Seekside product they offer is. Yep, so our Seekside pro um, product is uh, parentage and so it works on SNPs. Um, so some of you might be familiar with um, parentage and it's looking at um, you know, you submit your different sires and calves as well and determining which um, sire has um, sired which calf and it excludes them. So with Seek Sire, it actually works on, I think it's 500 different markers and excludes based on that. So it looks at the different um, pretty much profile of those 500 markers and which uh, size match with which calves based on those 500 markers and excludes them based on those markers as well. Um, thank you. Carolyn has asked, so can the TSU samples be kept in the fridge? Is it better to minimise temperature fluctuations or just at room temperature better? Um, if you're, if you've taken them straight away and you're going to send them straight into us, that's fine. Like try and keep them um, at the room temperature. But if you're going to, if it's going to be a couple of weeks before you send them into us and you've already taken that sample, I would recommend keeping them um, within probably the fridge just to, um, yeah, to keep it more stable because that fluctuation um, can cause the DNA to degrade. So if you can keep it up 
at a set, uh, stable temperature, um, that's preferred. So after we do all our testing with a TSU, we actually store them all in um, a cold room for that 12 month, until that 12 month period is up. Righty. Um, I'll just scroll back up here. Where can you purchase vials and applicators in New Zealand and how much do they cost? If, what if, was that? Sorry, Hannah. Where can you purchase vials and applicators in New Zealand and how much do they cost if, you know? Um, in New Zealand, I'm not 100% sure. I think PBB, you can buy them, um, purchase them through them. Um, but you could also purchase them through us and we could um, post them over to New Zealand as well. Right. Um, is the actual processing of the sample faster where a TSU has been used? Compared to hair? Is that what they yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah, heaps, heaps quicker. So I, I actually used to do a bit of work in the labs. Um, and so when a hair sample... A lab staff actually has to sit there and cut each individual hair sample and the follicles of the hair sample. Um, with a TSU sample, we can literally plate them up and just transfer uh, that buffer out into our DNA plates. So it takes only a couple of minutes to do uh, a TSU plate. So a plate has 96 samples in it. So we can do that within a couple of minutes. And a hair sample, it can take a couple of hours to cut a full plate of hair. Right, yeah. That's for DNA extraction, though. Um, for the rest of the lab process, it doesn't, uh, you know, PCR, that's um, a set time. We can't speed up PCR, unfortunately. That's just science. Yeah. yeah. Um, so after someone gets a test done, say, on a TSU vial, how long... Do Neogen keep the sample that's left? So if they wanted to get a done sample tested later on, how many, mm -hmm. like, what is the time period that you would get results out of that done sample still? Yep, so um, Orflex recommends, so Orflex who um, created and supplies the TSU vials, they've recommended that we... Um, and everyone keeps the sample for 12 months and that's really only viable for 12 months. So once you send in those samples and we process them, we store them for that 12 month period. So if you've had that sample, sent that sample in, we've tested it and within that 12 month period, you wanted another test done, um, you just tell us the animal ID and the sample barcode from that CSU and we'll go pull it out of storage and retest it for you guys. So after 12 months, you would recommend members just send in a new sample if they can? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, someone's asked, are the vials applicators free if ordered from Neogen? No, the applicators also have to be purchased. Um, and the last question I've got here is once a sample has been sent in, is their DNA always now on file forever? The DNA, we do, so once the DNA is extracted from the sample, we also do store um, the DNA for a period of time as well. Righty. Um is Neogen now finding more TSU samples coming in compared to hair samples? Yeah, absolutely. I would say probably 60% TSU, 40% hair. Yeah, okay. Well, probably, that's interesting. Probably, probably even more. Uh, is... So to send to New Zealand, is it the same 
import permit from New Zealand as with hairs. So I would assume they're asking about the vials and applicators. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to give you a definite answer on that one. I haven't dealt much with um, samples coming in and out of New Zealand and outside of Australia, so I wouldn't be able to give a direct answer on that. But I know um, PBB, they send us a lot of samples. Um, they're based in New Zealand, so we get samples from there regularly. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? I've got one here from Jasmine about they used to offer a 150k SNP test, but now have gone back to offer only the 100k only. Um, Jasmine, I'm not exactly sure about that. I um, only started in this new role a few months ago, so I I never came across um, 150k SNP test. I've only always dealt with 100k one. Sorry. Um. So with our um, test as well, so like the 100K test, it runs on a 100K SNP that's supplied by um, Illumina. So if Illumina discontinues a product, we, we don't have a chip to run that product. So that could be possibly an answer to why they don't do a 150K SNP test anymore. Maybe Illumina um, doesn't make the 150K chip anymore. That's one thing that could be a reason to that, but other than that, I don't know why, sorry. Are you able to explain uh, what the difference is between a MIP and a SNP profile? Because I know it is a, quite a common question that we get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, no, I can. It's, um, it's, hopefully I can explain it um, in a best way possible. So historically, all DNA and parentage testing has been completed on um, your microsatellites, which is your MIP technology. Um, and now we use your SNP, which looks at your single nucle nucleotide polymorphism testing, which is the new form of DNA um, technology. So DNA microsatellite markers, or short tandem repeat markers, looks at the allele. Um, and so it pretty much looks at the repeated um, section um, of that allele. Um, whereas single nucleotide um, polymorphisms, so your SNP testing is um, one of the, the, the new forms of genotyping and it differs between the MIPS um, as it looks directly at the nucleotides. So it looks at your A, G, and um, T, C in the DNA strand rather than the repeating fragments that uh, what MIP looks at. Um, so with your SNP testing, uh, especially in parentage, it looks at those 500 different markers, whereas with um, MIPs, they were only looking at 21 um, different markers. So that's it in a nutshell, pretty much the difference of what they look at and how many different markers um, compared to two that they look at. And that's why you can't parent verify a SNP animal to a MIP animal, is that right? Yeah, yeah, so they're utilising um, DNA in two different ways. So it's kind of almost comparing apples with oranges, if you look at it that way. Um, MIPS is looking um, at DNA in a different kind of way compared to SNPs, and but SNPs is a lot more accurate and um, more advanced um, and looks at a higher um, section of the DNA compared to a MIP. Radio. Um. So MIPs instead of so MIPs are looking at the repeated fragments of DNA where SNP testing looks at the changes to single nucleotides at um, certain places of the markers. Yeah, because um, I know that is quite a common question that we get <laughs> about MIPS and SNPs. 
Yeah, um, yeah, it's a very common question. I do have a um, a text sheet available that I can send um, for you guys to send out to your your customers if you want about MIPS and SNPs. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, and what else do I have here? This may depend on what societies charge for their testing, but what is the difference in cost for a test of tissue and to a test of hair? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that could differ um, between um, breed societies, but coming directly and buying um, samples. So hair is... Uh, three dollars twenty and then plus you got a oh no sorry a hair card is one dollar twenty to purchase and but then you get a three dollar um, surcharge with that and then TSU is um, three dollars to purchase so um, work, hair works out to be four dollars twenty whereas TSU only costs three dollars per sample yeah um, should New Zealand members try to get vials and applicators and send them, send the samples through PBB in New Zealand or should New Zealand just contact all Flex New Zealand? Um, it would be dependent on which way uh, you would want to go. If you wanted to go through PBB, so they're like a consultant, if you wanted to go through them, um, they will pretty much manage your data for you. Um, but if you wanted to just send in a sample without going through a consultant, uh, it would be probably best to just contact Orflex New Zealand. So it's just dependent on which way you would want to go with sampling and your results. Um. Radio. Does anyone else have any more questions? That's all the questions that I've had come through to me. There's been a few, which is good. Well, Harry, that's all the questions that I've had come through to me so I think yeah unless you've got anything else that you wanted to run through um no I don't have um any hopefully that covered everything um that you guys wanted to cover there's our contacts anyway so um there's our territory managers and Hannah our sales manager so if you need to contact any of us about uh genomic testing or TSU samples, just give us a call or you can email us and we're more than happy to help out. Um, if you've got any more questions, feel free to call or email or ask now. Um, I've just had one more come through. Mm -hmm. What's the life of the samples kept at home? What's the life of the samples, what, sorry? Kept at home. Kept at home. Um, oh, like once you take it, you know, Orflex recommends uh, the samples only viable within that 12 month period. So, you know, send it in for testing within that 12 months of taking the sample. Uh, well, thank you so much, Harry, for coming on with us tonight. It's been really good. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and yeah, hopefully I, I didn't go through it too quickly and I did cover all the main points. Um, for everyone.